Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 135 of ASBN Live, Making the Business Case for Regenerative and Just Agriculture in the 2023 Farm Bill. I'm your host, Delissi Sivalinga, the American Sustainable Business Network Senior Manager of Events and Programming. Today's webinar is presented by ASBN's Regenerative Agriculture and Justice Working Group, led by Colton Fagundes. Colton has brought together this wonderful panel of folks from his working group, and he'll tell you a little bit more about what they're up to, and we'll let everyone introduce themselves a little later on. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to you, Colton. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. Again, I'm Colton Fagundes. I manage our Regenerative Agriculture and Justice Working Group. And actually, before I get started and really get into the content here, I think I'm going to let all of our panelists introduce themselves. So let's pass it over to Ryan. Hi, everybody. I'm Ryan Anderson. I am the uh, Senior Vice President of Services at Steward. Uh, we're a company that's providing uh, financing for regenerative agriculture projects and other food system uh, activities. And let's go over to Jacqueline. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Van Manen. I use she and her pronouns. I'm development director with the National Young Farmers Coalition. Thank you, Dania. Hi, everyone. I'm Dania Davey. I'm the director of land retention and advocacy at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. Great, thank you. And Melissa and Susan. Hi there, Melissa Larson here with Thousand Hills Lifetime Grazed Grass-Fed Beef and with our producer Susan, we're calling in from her local area in North Texas, Susan Bergen. Fantastic, thank you. And so today we are all here to discuss making the business case for regenerative and just agriculture in the 2023 Farm Bill. So. I'm gonna let Dania get us started in a second to get like, what is the Farm Bill? Uh, many of you may already be working on the Farm Bill, Bill may be aware, but we don't wanna assume anything. So she's gonna get us started there. She's an expert, she's worked on past Farm Bills. Um, after that, we're going to move into just a little overview of what our working group and what we're working on in ASBN uh, within the 2023 Farm Bill to advance regenerative and just agriculture. And then we're gonna open it up to our panel. We're gonna talk about um, we're going to let uh, Ryan and Melissa and Susan go into, you know, why regenerative agriculture? What is the business case for regenerative agriculture? And how can we make that and achieve that in the Farm Bill? Then we're going to turn our attention over to Jacqueline and, and Dania, and they're going to give um, us a, a wonderful discussion on, you know, justice and equity. Why is that important? Why is it important in the context of regenerative agriculture? And again, how, how can we achieve that in the Farm Bill? So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dania if you could get us started, thank you. Thanks Colton, I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, I, I draw heavily from the resources available on the National Sustainable Ag Coalition's uh, website. If you have not visited their website, they have some amazing resources and uh, I don't know that I can do as much justice by creating anything else. So I just wanna give a shout out to them for creating those great resources uh, that you'll see on your screen in just a second. But for those of you who are, who are uninitiated, the Farm Bill is a very broad piece of legislation that actually touches just about every aspect of our lives. The Farm Bill is usually passed every five years. Uh, there have been times when there's been a seven year gap between reauthorizations. The most recent Farm Bill was passed in 2018, and the next uh, Farm Bill is scheduled to be reauthorized in 2023. So the Farm Bill has 12 titles covering everything from commodity programs to nutrition programs to conservation, to energy, to forestry, you get the picture. It's really comprehensive. And you'll see the 12 titles uh, listed there in front of you. These slides will be available uh, after this presentation as well. But definitely a lot of interest for this group in particular in, in Title II, the conservation title of the Farm Bill. Uh, I think it's also really helpful to, to know what's not in the Farm Bill, especially because some of these categories that you see on the screen are of relevance to the folks that might be listening into this conversation today. So there are things that are not covered, including some of the pesticide laws, 
Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. There's some grazing rights and irrigation rights. And very significantly, farm and food workers' rights and protections are not included in the Farm Bill. Uh, this slide is, again, from the National Sustainable Ag Coalition's website. I think it's really important just to see that there's there's a two-house, uh, two um, uh committee process for getting uh, the language of the farm bill generated those kind of work respectively through the House Ag Committee and the House Senate uh, and the Senate Ag Committee and then those uh, those drafts are presented to the full Senate and the full House of Representatives and then there's some conferencing amongst leadership from both the House and Senate uh, and they, they kind of generate like the mega version that's going to be presented to both full chambers for a final vote and once that process makes its uh, way through both of the um, both the House and the Senate, then it will, will be presented to the president for signature. I also like to highlight in, in talking about what the farm bill is, is that I feel like in farm bill years, there feels like there's a lot of pressure to get everything that you want done in the farm bill year. But I think it's really important to recognize that those of us that are in this space, there's basically no days off from thinking about the farm bill because there are lots of opportunities for advocacy. And for funders, it's important to note that there's lots of opportunities for supporting the work of the farm bill because one process is getting the programs that are really important into the farm bill, reauthorizing the farm bill and protecting the ones that we know are doing really good work. But another really big part that sometimes isn't as exciting is the appropriations and appropriations can mean the difference between just having language that's there uh, and, and having an actual program. And one example I can share is the heirs property relending program was passed in the 2018 farm bill and it wasn't, there, it wasn't appropriated for until last year and it hasn't been it wasn't announced until this year so it's really important to note that there's an appropriations process that takes place that is as important um, and and gives us additional opportunities to advocate and intervene in the implementation of the farm bill and again another big uh, hiccup from that example i shared before for the air property relending program is the rulemaking without getting those regulations and those rules um, put in place, there really is no implementation of the programs that we, we work really hard to get aligned on and get into the farm bill. So it's really important that those of us that these issues are important to are engaged in that rulemaking process whenever those rules are published. It's important that we are making public comment, making sure our constituents, our members, our folks are aware and understand how significant rulemaking is and again, like I said, I feel like it takes a little bit of the pressure off of, of Farm Bill advocacy when you recognize that there are all these other advocacy uh, intervention points. So that's the, the quick and dirty overview of the Farm Bill. Thank you so much, Dania. It's extremely helpful. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Just one moment. Oops, so apologies, wrong, wrong screen share. Um, all right, got some slides for you all here. So again, uh, I lead our Regenerative Agriculture and Justice Working Group at the American Sustainable Business Network. Just a confirmation from my panelists, you're not seeing my notes, right? Good, okay, thank you. Um, this initiative we launched in 2020, uh, late 2020, bringing together a cross uh, industry of, well, cross industry, uh, cross, apologies, um, a cross industry of businesses uh, together with stakeholders such as farmers and farm workers to collaborate on public policy. Uh, we established early on our collective principles uh, these were to guide us in what do we mean by regenerative agriculture, what do we mean by justice and equity, and what are we trying to achieve through engaging a public policy. And you have to sign on to those principles to join this group. And this is a smattering of some of the businesses that are involved, some of the other stakeholders. This needs to be updated, and there's actually quite a few more that are involved in our work. So first, you know, defining our terms, regenerative agriculture, no universal definition uh, of it, but there's these general high level definitions that most people 
seem to agree with, and this is sort of the what we're taking in our work. It's an approach to farming that uses a combination of place and context based practices like managed grazing, nor minimal tillage, composting, cover crops and crop rotations to build soil health, minimize inputs and enhance biodiversity. So we're talking about practices and we're talking about outcomes. Um, we're not just talking about practices, we want to actually achieve soil health, environmental and other ecological outcomes. Um, it is vital in our fight against climate change, um, improving soil health sequesters CO2 in the soil. And it's also extremely important to note, the, the regenerative agriculture is a newer term. It is not a newer practice. It has been practiced for millennia across the world by indigenous peoples and other small scale farmers and ranchers, including in the United States. Um, we must note that African-American farmers and uh, immigrant farmers from Latin America have kept their ancestral practices which are regenerative uh, alive in this country. So the main thing we're working on right now is the 2023 Farm Bill. We went through a stakeholder engagement process, um, cons consultation with our members and we voted. We came up with sort of these high level priorities that you're seeing right here. Um, we're working on getting a little more specific in what achievable policy asks and when we, we, can, we can make with Congress and working with our partners. Um, but these high level sort of principal priorities, there's a sign on letter that we have. Uh, we split it into three buckets, support, invest, and incentivize. So we're talking about supporting discriminated against marginalized farmers, uh, small scale farmer and ranchers. Um, and the first bucket is land access and retention, and debt relief. Um, our panelists later are gonna talk more about this. Um, similarly, um, the invest bucket, um, some of our other panelists will delve deeper into this, but we're talking about investing in creating regional markets and infrastructure and processing and making sure that small scale and regenerative producers have better access to markets. And then actually this third bucket, we aren't, I don't think gonna touch on as much uh, later on, but it, it's just a vital piece of the puzzle. And Dania did mention it earlier. Um, uh, we're calling it incentivize. And uh, a big part of this is working with the existing USDA conservation programs, um, which can incentivize, conduct training, outreach, and payments to farmers to adopt conservation practices. How can we improve these to be better targeted towards soil health, regenerative practices, organic practices, uh, combating climate change? How can these be programs be more accessible? We also wanna see more funding um, they are overprescribed. There was a increase, huge increase in funding the Inflation Reduction Act, um, but we want to build on that. And then also we're talking about federal, federal crop insurance, which is a huge priority and has been for a while for many in the sustainable regenerative community. It's one of the main of those sort of much maligned farm bill subsidies that you hear about. Um, and the vast majority of it goes towards conventional industrial monocrops and actually has barriers to soil health practices. So how can we transform these programs to be uh, more, not, uh, not have barriers, but actually reward soil health regenerative practices that science has shown has actually reduce farmers' risks in the face of um, climatic uh, extreme weather and, and market fluctuations. So then the main thing moving forward, you know, with these farm bill priorities and this letter in our campaign, how can we catalyze broad business support for public policies that support a transition to regenerative agricultural economy? So that's with the sign-on letter that we have. We have over 200 businesses, farmers, associations that have signed on. Please consider signing on, sharing with your network. We wanna get that number up. We're trying to reach those members of Congress that might not see eye to eye to us and make that business economic case to them. If you wanna get more involved with this work, uh, please reach out to me. We'll share all these links and slides in the follow-up. And I'm gonna pass this over now to our first panel um, of, uh, and this would be Melissa, Susan, and Ryan. And we're going to address the question, how can we catalyze that broad business support for regenerative agricultural policies? And so to get us a little broader, uh, Susan and, and Melissa and Ryan, um, why regenerative agriculture? Why is it important for your business? Um, this is Susan, and um, thank you for engaging with uh, the people that are boots on the ground because it really does make a difference. Um, through support of uh, Thousand Hills, who sends me technical support once a year, and uh, the Noble Research Institute in Ardmore, Oklahoma, we have been trained on best management practices that were about 180 degrees from what we were uh, previously doing. Um, we uh, embrace that wholeheartedly on 20,000 acres of uh, property that we own as a family. And we started doing that last October. We were all in 
and uh, readjusting our, um, you know, where we spend our resources to um, not fighting with the system, but engaging with the system. So instead of spraying, we put all that money into fencing, fence posts, um, gators, different things to do to start regenerative agriculture. We did not know at the time that we were in the beginning of a, of a really intense drought, but we, as the time went on, um, we have been listed in a level four drought all of this year. It's, it's been 12 months that we're in that. Um, we have had one large rain event here in North Texas. Um, of that, we did not discharge a single drop of water off of our ranch we were able because of the new practices to absorb all of that water. So we, um, we have continued to graze. We um, have reduced our numbers, um, but we have continued to graze our operations and stay the course as Savory says, you know, the rain will come, just keep doing the next right thing, which seems really difficult when it's 110 degrees and it, there's no rain in the 10 day forecast, but we stayed the course. Um, during that time, we were able to ship cattle to um, our partner. And that's how I think of Thousand Hills as my partner in what I'm doing. And uh, we were able to produce prime beef in that horrible drought during uh, those horrible hot days. So um, all of the buckets that you spoke of um, we are addressing. Um, as far as, you know, we believe that it's important that every uh, staff person on my team have a living wage. We also know that that living wage is really, the demand on money has uh, really increased with fuel and, um, you know, food prices. So we are actively engaged in, um, we practice um, an open set of books where the choices that you're making on the ranches affect the available money that we have to give back to our team members. So the, um, when you're doing regenerative ranching, instead of spending money on inputs, you can have more money available to share with your team members. Um, and then what uh, Melissa has measured here today is that we have tremendously soil, uh, healthy soil, even after this horrible drought, and we have outstanding forage. Um, you know, I hate to do fence line comparisons, but it would be really easy even to pull up a current satellite image to show the difference between our regenerative ranching practices and the uh, set stocking rate, which is the standard for most people. <laughs> we find that, as you said, in the farm bill, it incentivizes what I would consider bad behavior. And I was one of those people behaving poorly. So what I would like to see more than anything is the support in education practices. Um, I think with the young farmer, the farmer to farmer training, we have an open housing unit on our 12,000 acre ranch where someone could come and stay for six months. I don't think it's an easy concept that they're learning. I think it's counterintuitive. Um, it's been difficult for my team members who did it the way their dad did it for years. But um, through um, the resource, the encouragement, we have weekly staff meetings where we talk about what's going difficult. How, how can we support you? What do we need to help? Um, but I think it takes a lot of resources to get that change first in mindset and then, oh my gosh, how do I actually do that? Mm -hmm. So at um, all of our ranches, we have um, buggies that they drive to put in the um, electric fence posts. Everyone has a different system. Every system is perfect. We don't have an opinion about that. But it's great if someone to, were to come see that we don't, it's not one right way. The, the right thing to do is to do the management intensive grazing and to, to get them off and give the rest. So that's, that's a lot of words, but um, <clears throat> we've had huge success when um, the weather service says we should be in total failure. Mm -hmm. I, I would be curious to hear, you started um, mentioning, sort of, you know, you've had to reduce uh, the, the herd size a little bit. A lot of ranchers all across the United States, particularly in the West, have had to make those reductions this year. Do you feel like you've been able to retain a higher stocking rate than the sort of conventional ranchers in your region? I have, yes, I've really outperformed um, and I try not to be in competition with them because I have mm -hmm. compassion on them. Mm -hmm. What I think they don't have is the education 
right. that I have been um, fortunate to, to have been given. But yes, they, we've, we probably have, we have way overproduced. Right. Um, I have all of my technical data that I, I use a software called Maya Grazing. And I'm happy to uh, furnish that to you, which shows the pounds of forage that I've, I've been able to produce in this drought, plus the pounds of um, beef that we've been able to produce, all while not having any bare ground. Nice. I, I love that. And I, when I was sort of preparing for this conversation, um, I was really thinking about, you know, how do we connect regenerative practices to businesses that are not in the food system, right? Like we at Steward, we're working with farms and food system businesses every day. I love your story. I love the work that you're doing. And I see the resilience of your business in that information, right? Like your business is going to be stronger and be able to weather the storm or lack of storm uh, a lot better because of those practices. But, you know, as we think about what does that mean for a company that doesn't have anything to do with the food system? They're not selling meat. They're not selling leather. They're not connected to that. What does that mean? And for me, it always, you know, it comes back to uh, sort of the quality of life for your employees and the economic circumstances of your customer base, right? And we're seeing in the economy right now, significant inflation in food prices. And there are a multitude of factors that are going into why food prices are rising. But one of the big pieces is climate change and the environmental threats that are created, right? We're seeing ranches all across the United States have to reduce their herd sizes because of this drought, which in the short term, I don't know, folks might've noticed beef is actually cheaper right now than it was six months ago. The reason is everybody's reducing their herds, right? And so they're saying, we can't sustain this herd size on this property because there's a drought. So we're gonna actually sell off some of these cattle for slaughter. So the short-term impact looks great, but what happens in 2023, 2024, is you have smaller sets of breeding herds, you have fewer births, so the availability of beef next year is going to be much lower. You're gonna have fewer cows on dairy farms. You're gonna have fewer cows that are of the right age to slaughter. And so then you're gonna see beef prices go way up next year. And that's something that's gonna be a result of the drought we're experiencing this year and the lack of resilience in those uh, conventional operations, right? And so like your practices, not only is it good for your business, but it's good for the economy as a whole because that resilience is gonna protect us against price fluctuations in food, which is gonna have a huge impact on where you know your employees are, whether they're demanding raises because food is more expensive, whether your customer base is gonna say, oh, you know, I can't buy your product um, because it's too expensive and you know food prices went up, I have to make a cut somewhere. Um, so it really, that trickles through to everyone. So um, thank you for those comments. What I really want to say was the first part of what I said is that we had a huge rain event. Right. Um, we measured 14 inches. The national weather won't, they won't approve that um, measurement. But so we'll just go with, I had eight inches of rain and I did not discharge a drop. Yeah. So we know that the floods that are coming and going are a result of agricultural practices. Mm -hmm. So so when you're trying to get people to have buy-in, let's just talk about the flooding event that happened in Dallas, yeah. that better farming practices would have stopped. Um, on I was telling Melissa that on my uh, ranch up in Oklahoma, when I bought it, we could infiltrate a quarter inch of water. Well, we have five inch rain events. Now I'm taking all five inches in an hour in. So I am stopping the flooding. So even if, if they can't see, well, how does this affect me? It really affects everyone because I'm recharging the aquifer right. I'm, and I'm stopping the flooding. So if, it, you know, it, there's a lot of ways that, that it affects everybody, what happens. Right. And that's right. And it's, it's your soil health. You've been building that soil to retain that water in yes. a way that conventional farms don't. Yes. Yes. And we, we do not use any inputs. We use, um, and I love that com compost is part of the conversation because we use a tremendous amount of compost because the soil is so locked up. You've got to get it regoing. Mm -hmm. 
Thank, thank you, Ryan and, and Susan, and I'm pass it to you, Melissa. Um, but yeah, yeah. They, I just I just want to reiterate that both of those were really building on this business economic case that we're talking about. You know, Ryan, a food security and economic health case for for regenerative agriculture, um, and and Susan, you know, really um, as you nailed down there in, in your second part of your comments, or as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, resiliency just uh, across supply chains and ac across the land and across regions, you know, we, regenerative agriculture is not only valuable for, for this resiliency in the agro-food supply chains, but also um, stopping flooding that's affecting supply chains um, uh, across sectors and industries. And so, Melissa, it would be great for you to, to build on that, you know, also talk about maybe your experience in, in communicating regenerative agriculture with the consumers that you sell to and, and also just talk about your business in general. Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to. And I'm so glad that um, Susan was able to share her perspective and um, talk about literally what we're seeing here on the ground. And she, um, I'm so proud um, to be working with her and then 50 other farmers and ranchers across the country. Um, and, and you can tell that regenerative agriculture is woven into the core of Thousand Hills and what we do, um, all built on the mission of to nourish the soil, the plants, cattle, and people um, by holistically grazing those cattle for their lifetime. Um, but another whole component of that, of the resilience piece, is the decentralized bus business model that Thousand Hills runs on. Um, so that means it's a, rather than thinking of it as a chain or our supply chain, it's a web. It's a network of those farmers like Susan and, and 50 others across the country. Um, all building up resiliency on their land while also um, collectively working on um, grazing cattle that are, are healthier for people and planet. In addition to that, we have um, processors um, spread around the country so that small to mid-sized processors, again, part of that decentralized model where um, the cattle don't have to travel many miles to get to their processor, um, they're smaller, and we can work with them in maybe a more nimble sense. Um, and and um, we didn't have any, any major supply issues when so many others did during uh, the pandemic and the COVID situation. Um, in addition to that, there's a variety of, you know, distributors we're working with and retailers. So when you kind of almost visualize this, it kind of, you need lay this out in a map of the United States, it is a web and it, it's hard to break that because it is so interconnected and resilient. Um, um, and I think Susan also had a great point of making sure rural economies are thriving. Um, she was talking about making sure that those who are running and managing the farms are getting paid well. And that's um, part of the way Thousand Hills approaches things as a brand too. So the majority of the dollars that come into Thousand Hills go right back into the farmers um, and then the processors and then the small piece back for sales and marketing. So um, it's those types of components help build up the resiliency that is also on the ground and in the soil, literally our foundation at the same time. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and then and we'll get into the consumer part too. Um, maybe we'll... Uh, kind of bounce some questions about on about uh, resiliency, but we also have some consumer things that we're really proving. Um, actually, well, I'll just share quickly. Um, yeah, measurement of ecological outcome verification, making sure that we are measuring what is happening on the ground. And then that third party verification um, is, is a consumer facing credibility piece that they know those practices behind the product before the, before the product hits the shelf, those practices matter and it makes a difference in the product that they're buying. So that's through the land to market program, um, American grass fed association. And now we're looking to work with Audubon to make sure that um, we have thriving bird communities and diverse bird communities within um, farms and ranches. Great, thank you, Melissa. Yeah, you all are doing fantastic work and showing showing the, the real potential um, of, of growing business in the, in the regenerative sector and and the the consumer demand that is is there. And there seems to be more support. Um, 
before we move on to our next panel, uh, Ryan, Melissa, or Susan, did you have sort of any any closing thoughts and we move on to our next topic? Yeah, I would maybe just one last parting thought is, you know, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization has estimated that under current ag practices, we're going to run out of topsoil in 60 years. Mm -hmm. And 95% of the food that we eat is grown in topsoil. And the reason that we're running out of topsoil is because conventional agriculture is destroying the soil. We are literally killing the soil and it's washing away in these flooding events, right? The fact that Susan's ranch kept all of that water, it didn't flood, also meant that she retained her topsoil. Her neighbor, with all that water rolling off, was pulling that healthy topsoil away. It ended up in the Red River and it's down in the Mississippi right now. And so we really need to shift our practices as a society because this is, this is essential to our ability to feed ourselves. And it's the intensive tilling, it's the lack of cover crops, and it's the use of synthetic fertilizers that are killing topsoil and creating this significant threat um, to just our, our ability to feed ourselves. Thank you, Ryan. Food for thought, definitely. Um, moving on to our next panel, uh, Dania and Jacqueline. Just to, to cue you up, so we're going to be talking about justice and equity, how that's central for regenerative Brazilian agriculture. But, you know, just a little background for, and I don't want to take too much time because you two are more of the experts, but for those of the, uh, those of us that are joining us on the call today, if you're not aware, there's a long, long history, terrible history of discrimination, racism at the USDA, which towards you know, black, indigenous, Latino, Asian women and, and other farmers and ranchers. And it has, it's well-documented. It's been the, the focus of several different lawsuits. Um, and there's been some remediation um, that has happened and, and progress, um, but there's still not, not enough has been done. More needs to be done. Um, and it has been, uh, has facilitated the, the concentration of ownership of farmland and access to, to resources and markets in our agricultural economy. And with that, um, sort of a parallel um, uh, process has been just the general uh, favoritism of the USDA towards larger scale um, conventional farmers, um, which has provided also barriers to, to young and smaller scale farmers and ranchers. So we're gonna touch on all of that today. And I think we're gonna start off with Jacqueline. Um, can you speak to why just beyond the moral and ethical imperatives, why is justice and equity important for advancing regenerative agriculture? Yeah, hi, it's Jacqueline, National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, yeah, for, you know, for us, when we think about regenerative agriculture, you know, of course, we talk a lot about things like soil health and climate, but we know that part of regenerative ag agriculture is repairing the past harms, whether it be environmental or societal. Um, and so for us as a coalition, it's really about equitably resourcing this next generation of working farmers, um, really with a strong emphasis on the next generation of BIPOC farmers. Um, we do this in a lot of different ways. Obviously, advocacy is like our main way of doing it and in building power amongst our farmer leaders. Um, but one of the things that I thought y'all would be interested in hearing about today, we've actually just released our National Young Farmer Survey, which is a survey of over 10,000 Young farmer leaders, yes, we're so excited. Um, it's a massive survey. We've heard from the USDA. Um, our past surveys in 2017 and 2014 have been on their desks that they, they use this, especially as they're thinking about policy and how to support the next generation of producers. Um, and, you know, paints a picture of who this next generation of farmers are so that we can really direct policy that reflects their lived experience. Um, it also paints what their challenges are, um, but it, a lot of the data really gives me hope about um, what's to come in, in agriculture if we're able to equitably resource this next generation. Um, so specifically in terms of regenerative agriculture, we found um, that it, it really is like the purpose for our farmer leaders. And um, we found that when we asked them like, 
really why are you farming especially most of them are first generation farmers they did not grow up farming that they chose this path for themselves and 83% of them said that their reason for farming was to engage in conservation or regeneration as, as their practice, as their way to contribute justice to this world, whether it be through their land, through their community. Um, and so um, we know that they don't need convincing uh, to engage in these practices, which is awesome. Um, we found that this number was higher too, for particularly for black farmers it was 88% and 87% of all BIPOC farmers in our network engage in conservation or regeneration um, or state plainly that they are using regenerative practices. Um, so like I said, you know, when we talk about when we talk about regenerative ag, we cannot leave out equity. Um, we need to recognize that in order to engage in these practices that farmers need land. Um, and that is the number one challenge faced by farmers in our network. Um, the average age of the farmer, as you all very well know, is, is nearing or over at this point 60 years old. Um, and over 40% of agricultural land is scheduled to transition within the next next decade. So as those farmers leave, who is going to take over? And how do we make sure that this land um, and that land access can really be centralized in this next farm bill? So it's really our main priority. And we're working with really great partners in this on a campaign that we're calling the 1 million acres for the future campaign. Um, and working with really awesome partners like Dania, um, as well as the Intertribal Ag Council. Um, Rural Coalition and a lot of other folks to ensure that this farm bill prioritizes land because we feel like we can't wait uh, to get these this next generation of farmers on land. Thank you, Jacqueline and Dania. I'm just going to ask you if you could expand on on the previous question and sort of bring your own perspective and that of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Absolutely. I, Jacqueline just kind of knocked it out of the park. I'm really excited. I think it's it's a really exciting time to be working on Farm Bill because data is finally like, okay, like <laughs> some of the emotion has been taken out of it after years of, you know, working on this. I think that uh, anti-Black racism plays a very interesting role in our agricultural economy. And I think that without addressing the fact that uh, you know, some of the practices of disenfranchising and, um, you know, stripping African American land wealth over over this country's history have played have kind of laid the, the long game for all of the other groups that have experienced uh, inequities and discrimination entering uh, the, the agricultural uh, economy. And so I think it's kind of fundamentally imperative that we address this issue of African American land loss. And just quickly, for those who haven't heard the statistic, uh, so by 1910, 218,000 Black farmers had acquired 15 million acres of land. And by 1992, there were only about 18,000 Black farmers remaining, owning about 2.3 million acres of land. That represents a 90% decline in both Black farmers and Black-owned land. And there folks who will say, you know, what about development? We're less of an agricultural uh, in this, uh, com country as we've become more industrialized, but there does appear to be a racial uh, component to the rates at which we're seeing land wealth lost uh, to the Black community. So from 1993 to 2003, approximately 94% of Black farmers lost some part or all of their land, which was three times the rate of white farmers for the same period. And I think it's important uh, to, to just think about once you have institutionalized practices that, that are established to dispossess folks of land, uh, that is going to have impacts. And I was really excited when Heather McGee's book, I'm going to share some posts and um, some links in the chat, but uh, I'm going to also share my screen very quickly uh, so that folks can, can follow along with some of these links. But um, Heather McGee wrote a book that I drive around the South a lot. Our membership is throughout the entire Southeast. And so podcasts are like my best friend. So there's this really great uh, podcast interview with Heather McGee talking about her recent book, The Sum of Us. 
us, which explores the hidden cost of racism. And I think everyone on this call, if you haven't heard that podcast, definitely listen to it, share it with everyone you know, because there is a cost, there's a financial cost to all of our economies when we want to preserve white supremacy, right? So NPR reported that there's an estimate out by Citibank Group that, uh, you know, $13 trillion were lost to our entire economy because of this anti-Black racism in discriminatory lending practices, right? And so um, Heather McGee really traces uh, a really, really great line of, of history showing the ways in which there were efforts made, uh, there were efforts made between and across racial differences between white workers, uh, you know, between white workers and black workers, between white uh, farmers and black farmers, and, and those costs we have all inherited them. They're in the cost of living being higher in places where there's concentrations of whiteness, the cost of educating the next generation. And so uh, it's kind of the fundamental question that we have to answer as a nation. And the Farm Bill uh, is an opportunity for us to really get it right this time. I think that if we really center the importance of racial equity in this conversation and in this Farm Bill, uh, that's what our membership voted on. When we met last month, our membership voted on our farm bill priorities and all of our priorities, you'll see a theme I'm going to share again just very quickly because this these slides will be available to everyone. But all of our priorities start with this call for racial equity. And part of that is coming out of the experience that we had um, in terms of advocating for the, the debt relief that was promised uh, under the American Rescue Plan, Section 1005, uh, and, and what has happened with the Inflation Reduction Act, but without centering racial equity, uh, we're, we're going to experience the loss of, of ancestral knowledge and land management practices. There's a cost of, of excluding African-American folks and folks of color from being uh, around the table to make these decisions, because all of that ancestral knowledge, all of that land stewardship knowledge, all of those holistic agro, uh, um, agricultural practices that are that are baked into regenerative ag is is lost to us, and so there's there's definitely ways to measure this morally and and um, you know uh, value in, in values, but absolutely we can see these impacts having. Devastating costs financially to our economy, and so that's really what I think is the charge for our generation and, and our advocacy around the farm bill. Thank you so much, Dania. And you know, um, before we move on, um, because we do have a little bit of time, then we'll jump into Q and A from the audience. But I just wanted to allow, um, because I, I I know you were trying to keep within our time limits and I appreciate that Dania and Jacqueline but just allow both of you maybe a little bit more to to expand on those farm bill priorities um, that you're advocating for um, and just to make them a little more concrete and you know Dania you just had them up and we again we're talking high level which is sort of what we need to do in, in the time limit that we have but maybe if you could just get a little more in specific into um, one of your asks or a couple of your asks just to, to provide our audience a little bit of understanding of, hey what exactly we're we trying to achieve in the farm bill. Jacqueline how, how about you go first? Sure okay. yeah go for it. Um, yeah I mean for us um, our main priorities like I said well our main priority number one for the farm bill is our one million acres for the future campaign which would secure a 2.5 billion dollar investment in land access for this uh, next generation of far working farmers. And this program or this uh, campaign includes some basic things that you would think the USDA would already have in place considering the land crisis that is upon us with, again, I'll say it again, 40% of agricultural land scheduled to transition within the next decade. 
there's not one person at the USDA or one office that is responsible for land and thinking about this transition. So it's one of our major asks is making sure that the USDA can actually connect all of the great resources that exist within the agency, um, but really at this like core purpose of, you know, who is going to steward this land in the future? How can we incentivize it to support this next generation of, of farmers, particularly young BIPOC farmers? Um, and so that's one of our, our major asks for our land campaign. Um, of course, we know that there's a really strong intersection of, of land and climate, um, and there's a lot of energy behind um, climate smart ag right now, um, obviously behind regenerative practices as we're all here today. Um, but we want to make sure that um, any, any climate uh, programs are truly equitable through the farm bill, so that includes um, ensuring that resources and programs are culturally appropriate. Um, that outreach to young and BIPOC farmers is invested in and improved um, because historically the USDA has not been very good at this. Um, and to, um, to be able to really conduct um, and make sure that um, these programs are truly accessible, hopefully regardless of citizenship or tax ID requirements, um, making it more accessible to com uh, community agencies and programs, you know, those folks that are really on the ground and doing the work, but just need that investment um, and that we can be able to drive resources to them easily, because um, that's the biggest thing that our, our members have told us about 71% of our members said that or the folks that completed the survey said that they were unfamiliar with federal programs that could help them to improve their farms. Um, and about 59% said that they didn't have the time to apply because the application is too burdensome. So, so much of the work that we are doing is, um, is also to be able to communicate like how to improve these programs to the USDA. And so you'll see a lot of that detailed within our young farmer survey that I shared earlier is also our agenda for the, for the farm bill. And that includes a lot of the policy asks that we will have through uh, our farm bill campaign. Thanks, Jacqueline and, and Dania, would you like to go into that a little bit? Absolutely, thank you so much uh, for giving us the opportunity to share. The, the Federation has a pretty, uh, pretty clear, path that we want to, uh, to, to navigate in terms of our farm bill priorities. Uh, number one, we have voted to improve racial equity in the conservation programs by ensuring that no less than 13% of what's set aside um, for Black farmers, um, that, that, that those programs match what we see in our society, right? And so there, you know, we won't go through all the list of all the ways in which African Americans have been underrepresented in all of those programs, uh, but we want to see those set asides matching what we have in our society because we definitely want to incentivize the next generation of folks, many of whom may not, like um, like Jacqueline just shared, many of whom may be first generation uh, folks because unfortunately because of discrimination and there have been a lot of would be next generation folks that are grew up on the farms that are from those communities that. Have been discouraged from carrying on their family's legacy and so uh, it's gonna it's gonna really be on us to ensure that what we see in those programs reflects what we see in our society because uh, we're going to need to incentivize folks to come into this industry in, in ways that haven't followed that generational path historically including um you know Im immigrants and other groups that that are that are going to need those set asides uh, in order to be competitive or to have those opportunities to access those conservation programs. We also want to make sure that there's enough resources set aside for technical assistance uh, to and and the establishment of some streamlined program application processes and conservation and credit. As Jacqueline said, new uh, uh, farmers and ranchers experience this regularly, and this is also something that has been historically and, and systematically and institutionalized into the way that the USDA makes its decisions. And so we really need to see uh, some streamlined processes with some more transparency around what those metrics are that go into the decisions of whether a conservation program is funded or not, whether a loan application is approved or not. 
as well as while there are a lot of opportunities within the microloan application, the, the purpose and part of why the Federation advocated for that $50,000 microloan to be available in, in previous farm bills was that we really wanna get those folks get getting access to capital as quickly as possible because of the history of discrimination that underserved communities have experienced in implying. Uh, we would like to see with the increase in input costs that $50,000 microloan being increased to $100,000. Um, in addition, we want to see the farm ownership and farm operating loan processes um, match that $600,000 limit that's available for farm ownership loans. We absolutely want to improve racial equity and access to credit by addressing this collateralization issue, which really came into focus for us through the debt relief process. As I've already stated, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act repealed Section 1005 of the American Rescue Plan Act. And so we're getting calls constantly from farmers who are anticipating foreclosure uh, when the foreclosure moratorium ultimately is lifted. And we really see how many folks are just overly collateralized on their farm loans. And so we're seeing folks you know, being threatened with the loss of their primary residence. Um, and so we really want to see that when those loans are being collateralized, that that uh, language in the handbook that is currently being interpreted as a baseline of 150%, the, the intent there is really up to 150% of the value of the loan being held as collateral. Uh, however, there's no process to make sure that that reflects uh, the, the property value increasing over the life of the loan. And so we absolutely want to make sure that we're protecting farmers' primary residences from collateralization. And we do want to see uh, a more concentrated effort to ensure that no more than 100% of the loan value uh, is being held as collateral. We're seeing microloans, a uh, farmer from North Carolina that I spoke with applied for a $50,000 microloan and was being told that they had to put their uh, 200 plus thousand dollar primary residence um, uh, as, as the equity for that 50,000, as the collateral for that $50,000 loan, right? So there's like rampant decisions that are making being made at the local level to put farmers in jeopardy of losing their primary residence uh, and much of the value of what they own in terms of their land and, and all their, their farm uh, equipment, et cetera, just to have uh, uh, an operating loan. And we just don't think that is going to benefit uh, Black and other historically discriminated against groups going into the future. And then finally, we're really focused on the next generation and making sure that in line with what the president and the administration has really prioritized to make sure that that student loan debt doesn't continue to be, you know, our generation's slavery, right? So we have folks that are making uh, making money just to pay down their student loan debt. It makes it very difficult if you're a first generation person. Myself, I'm a first generation immigrant. I went to law school. Uh, it, it's a barrier to a lot of folks. I was fortunate to get a fellowship to start my legal career, but it is a barrier for a lot of folks to going into the work that we need them in um, to, to benefit communities of color in the ag industry because they're having to prioritize taking jobs in industries that might not best serve their communities just to be able to pay down their student loan debt. So we want to incentivize uh, a loan, loan forgiveness programs focused on uh, Black farmers and Black professionals with a priority given to those who attend HBCUs such that over the course of five, working for five years uh, at community-based organizations and institutions that serve uh, Black and other farmers and ranchers of color, that those, those professionals get that benefit of student loan debt to make it possible for them to enter into these industries and, and provide those critical technical assistance and legal services that the community so desperately needs. And those are the priorities. Uh, the, they'll be available um, in a variety of ways, definitely on our website. But like I said before, this, this entire PowerPoint presentation will be available to anyone that's watching the presentation right now. Thank you so much, Dania and, and Jacqueline. And I, I hope that's sort of a illuminating for our audience about you know, all these sort of technical things within the farm bill, the changes that we, we can make. And a lot of these are hopefully achievable um, and can lead towards more transformative change in our food and agricultural system and, and address some of these long histories of injustice 
and help us with our transition to a more regenerative system. Really appreciate all of our panelists. We're gonna turn it over to Q&A from the audience now. We have quite a few questions actually gearing up already. If you, if you have others, please leave them in the Q&A box. Um, so we're gonna start with, uh, this is a, a pretty focused question and anyone can answer this, but I think this was targeted towards Melissa and Susan. Uh, it's from Dorothy Adams. How does this compost, how does a composting part of the process work in particular with a no-till approach? And I think this was, um, I believe this was, Susan, you, you, were, you were bringing up some of the practices that you're using. So I've paired with um, a big agricultural uh, waste producer, and then we uh, put either bad hay or um, ground wood chips with that, uh, which is, you know, a waste product. Most places in the United States have trees that they're trying to get rid of. So we grind, I have a grinding facility. I blend that. Composting is really a science, and um, I have a professional composter on staff, and then we have a spreading truck, and we spread. So we, we it's a fee for service to receive the inbound material. We take and we train, uh, we make that into a biodynamic soil. It's open source information. You can get it from the Institute of Local Self-Reliance on how to make compost, but then we spread it on the soil or um, when one of the ranches is a distance from us, we bring it and um, make compost tea and spread that. So um, we just, uh, we look for what is a waste product in the area and we try to, and we optimize that that reignites the soil and gets the, the healthy microbes and, and fungal going in the soil. And once it's once you've recharged it, then you're, um, you don't have to keep fighting it. You can just, it's done, unless you're pulling too much of a crop off. Great, thank you, Susan. So let's see, we got some other questions here. Um, how about, uh, this is a, um, pretty big question uh, coming from Barbara Brown, open to anyone. Um, are you preventing ultra rich from taking stock market gains and using it to buy up farmland? Like the, the recent Gates land grab, uh, Bill Gates, um, many of us have seen that in the news in the last year or so. Um, he says he's going to rent it back to farmers. Uh, you know, any, anyone want to tackle that? Any, any, does that overlap with any of your work at all? I know it's it's a, maybe something we can't fully address today, but any thoughts? So we are working with the National Family Farm Coalition on some research around these private equity practices. The Gates uh, example is a really strong one that are looking at farmland as just you know, you know something else to trade, right? So um, and and actually retirement. Um, you know, uh, re retirement uh, investors looking at now becoming land speculators. So there's definitely a lot of conflation of, uh, you know, misguided, I think, uh, folks who are making these investments. But obviously, yes, they're, they're absolutely the, the same uh, colonial practices that have been perfected globally are now, you know, uh, besieging America. As a matter of fact, I'm originally from Jamaica and my father recently were talking and he was like, America's just turning into Jamaica, right? Right? We should have stayed there because I think that all of those colonial practices that have been used to exploit uh, folks are coming home to roost. And so I think it's really critical that folks who, uh, you know, if you have a pension fund, if you're, in, you know, if you if you're involved in in uh, what's what stocks and um, your your investment funds are are involved in those portfolios, ask those difficult questions. Uh, we're we're in the process of having some research done, especially in the Mississippi Delta area, where we're getting lots of reports of farmers, especially farmers who owned heirs property. And heirs property is very susceptible to loss, is very susceptible to land speculation. Uh, and that is because what it is, is when land is inherited through generations without the, the first owner of that property having an estate plan, right? And so not having a will, not setting up a trust. And then as uh, the state's intestacy laws establish the default for which heirs inherit that property, you get in a position where there are multiple folks. I have just spoke to a family with 800 family members in Texas uh, uh, that uh, they own about uh, 250 acres of land that is now vulnerable to loss because 
who would have thought when 800 people are managing a land asset, someone might forget to pay the taxes, right? So these are these are threats that those speculators, they've, they've studied really well. That's basically how African-American beachfront ownership throughout uh, North, South, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and the northern part of Florida. That was kind of the bread and butter practice of some of these investment, real estate investment groups. They've now perfected that. They're exploiting uh, a lot of, of the urban areas Jacksonville, New Orleans, um, the Brownstones up in New York as well. We're just seeing this becoming perfected. And now uh, farmland is the, kind of the next wave of land that's being exploited by these investors. And so it's something that we're very, we're definitely keeping a pulse on. We're tracking, we're, like I said, we're, we're researching it uh, in partnership with National Family Farm Coalition. That's one of the priorities that we're working on with them. Uh, but it's, it's definitely something that we, we need to be paying attention to educating folks about getting these letters offering, you know, I'll pay $20,000 for this 117th interest in 80 acres of farmland that you own, not to be specific or anything, but they they follow a form like these, there's, there's a template, right? So um, these are, these are practices that we're just seeing copied and pasted throughout Africa, throughout the South. And, and we have to, as consumers of, of retirement funds, be very actively engaged in criticizing these practices before they become the norm. Thank you, Dania. Anyone else want to, to build on that from our panel? I have another thought on that. And that um, the way a land grant university teaches um, farmers to farm um, is not sustainable. And the cost associated with farming that way brings them huge debt. And then they're there's no way for them to stay on. So I think until we do the education component of how to make um, a reasonable living on, on a farm, it's not reasonable to have farmers. So I think for me, the, you can attract people to the farm if they can make a reasonable living. And the only way to do it is with regenerative practices. Thank you. So, couple questions here from Seth kind of tied to each other. Are you, um, are you aware of any peer-reviewed case studies that evaluate output and profitability comparing regenerative farms with conventional ones? And then tied, he had another question about studies. Uh, what's, what about scientific studies that analyze and quantify the amount of CO2 removed from the atmosphere from each acre farm that is farmed with regenerative farming practices? And Yes, there are studies. Uh, maybe we could share some of the follow-up, but does anybody want to touch on that in the panel? Just uh, if anyone thinks specific ones or examples. It might be, if no one wants to jump in, uh, that that uh, is there something we can point you to, Seth, in, a, in our follow-up. Help you find those studies. Because yes, definitely there has been um, quite a few um, analyzing different soil health practices, analyzing agroecological regenerative practices and systems and, and comparing the outputs and, and showing uh, resiliency in the face of uh, extreme weather events and reducing input costs and increasing overall profitability and, and so forth. There's a lot of emerging research on that. And also on, and there needs to be more and there needs to be more on, um, on the quantifying the CO2 as well. Um, there, there has been, uh, we need to understand that process better, um, especially as, as uh, it varies across regions and soils, um, how much we can actually uh, sequester, how much CO2. Um, and I see some people are sharing some studies in the chat, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask one question I saw. Um, this, it go. It's on indigenous um, issues in the farm bill. And we do not have the Inter Tribal Ag Council on today, who is, would be a great one to address this. Um, but from Jessica, uh, can someone give a quick explanation of how the farm bill intersects with tribal reservation land? Is there a separate program uh, since it doesn't seem like uh, we are addressing that here? Um, so, uh, Anyone want to tackle that? Anyone um, on our panel sort of feel knowledgeable, at least to touch on it, on tribal issues? 
I don't want to, I'm by no means an expert, but I do want to echo what Colton said about reaching out to Intertribal Ag Council. I believe their report and their recommendations have come out very recently. Amazing resource, amazing organization. And so absolutely reach out to them with that question because they, they're the experts. Same. I feel like I could talk a little bit about it, but I don't want to do it injustice. Uh, Jacqueline? Yeah, agreed. They're wonderful. And okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so we're getting uh, past the hour here. So maybe let's see if there's one more question and that can be sort of wrap things up. Um, we have a, a question from Barbara. How does, uh, and I guess this is aimed towards Dania. Um, how does collateralization work with state homestead laws and how does that prevent foreclosing on res residences? That's a great question. And uh, you, you would think <laughs> you would think that uh, that would eliminate these concerns. Unfortunately, uh, when USDA uh, uh, does elect to foreclose, uh, those their loan documentation is part of why it's like 35,000 pages long and, and 20 months worth of work is that they're they're uh, they're pretty airtight, right? And so those um, you know, there's there's a hereafter clause that basically can be uh, used to uh, collateralize anything purchased after that lawn is closed. And so there, there are folks who do lose their primary residence. They lose everything, their personal vehicles, anything that uh, can, can be tied to somehow the, the farm's production. Um, and, and hopefully a lot of the advocacy, I'm actually here in DC this week having a couple of conversations with folks about the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act, but in particular, those 17,000 farmers and ranchers that were promised the debt relief last year on the, under the American Rescue Plan Act, many of them are uh, concerned. I've spoken to a couple of Native American ranchers who've already uh, liquidated, in other words, sold their, their home and their ranching operation just to pay off this note. And so um, unfortunately, there are very few opportunities to keep that primary residence, um, bankruptcy being one of those options. Um, but we definitely need to see USDA generate a very uh, direct plan to make sure that we don't see that next wave of farmland loss and, and farm home loss. I mean, these are these are folks identities. I, I don't think that it can be um, appreciated by folks that are not in the ag industry. So as much as agriculture is an industry and it's an economy, like these are folks' heritages, their, their wealth, not just financially, but their family's legacy. And so when these homes are lost, it's it's not the same. I graduated uh, in 2008 during the, the market crash. And so there are lots of homes um, the, that we're, we were defending against foreclosure, but it's, it's quite a different situation for farmers. And as a matter of fact, even the bankruptcy court procedures are different for farm loans um, and farm foreclosures. And, and unfortunately, the USDA does have a broad, a long, very long arm in terms of what uh, can be sold during a foreclosure. And, and that's part of our advocacy work that we all need to be paying attention to, because as Jacqueline said, there, there's just like a natural uh, uh, anticipation of, of loss, but there's a concentration of, of anticipated land loss and farm loss and home loss amongst uh, farmers and ranchers of color, women farmers, that we should all be up in arms about because going back to the original question of, of this conversation, there's not just a moral or ethical imperative. This is going to be a cost. Our farmers are first responders. Those were the folks during the COVID epidemic that were feeding their communities, that were providing for their communities. And so without that safety net for our rural communities, what, what does hunger look like? What does community health look like? What, what do the needs of children in rural communities look like when we cut off this lifeline to our farmers and our, our farming community? And so it's, it's a, something that Federation works on every single day. Obviously, all the partners on this call are very passionate and adamant about, um, but I think it's really important, like you said in your question, that we make those connections and that we all take that charge on. You might not work on farm bill policy, right? But you can see all the ways that they're offshoots with that foreclosure process being a prime one that we can think about, like what would 
uh, good loan practices, loan modification practices look like for the USD. I think we have an opportunity with this administration to shape that so that we're not using processes that were created out of the 1980s farm crisis, but addressing the needs of farms um, and farmland owners today. Thanks, Jenya. And I know I said the last question was the last one, but people are still on the call and I wanna give Ryan a chance to talk because he's been quiet for a while. So I'm gonna direct this last question towards him and others can jump in too. Um, and this one's coming from Klaus Major, one of our members. Um, and it's sort of a, a, a broad question. Um, you know, how can we, so your experience at Steward in working with regenerative producers, so what do you see in the 2023 Farm Bill that can get you closer to the vision that that steward and yourself vision for the future of agriculture? I mean, that's a huge question, right? There's a lot of changes that we could be looking at. I mean, um, about one. <laughs> just, just one, right. I mean, what I love about the platform that ASBN and the working group have put together and sort of we are advocating on the Hill, right? Is it's really focused on a couple of the key pieces and making sure that resources are more available and more easily accessible to uh, the broader set of producers. It's, you know, BIPOC farmers, young farmers, new and beginning farmers, small scale farmers, regenerative farmers. There's a lot of overlap in those communities and helping you know, all of those priorities together is how we're going to build up farms that are using the right practices to protect our agriculture and move us in the right direction. And so I really just, I like that policy uh, that we've been able to pull together uh, that hopefully people can support. Um, I think the work that Federation of Southern Cooperatives is doing, like that policy outline that you uh, laid out, Dania, that's fantastic. We need to be doing all of those things. And getting rid of the bureaucratic nightmare that is interacting with the USDA is probably the least sexy policy proposal that you could make, but it's so crucial. Like I used to work on the Hill. I used to be a professional grant writer. I have a lot of capacity to deal with crazy bureaucracy. And we spend so much time at Stewart helping farmers try to navigate those programs. And if you're gonna say that this is a program that's designed to provide support to farmers, and then you create what is, you know, hundreds of pages value-added producer grants. I, we put those together and they're literally over a hundred pages long, all of the information they're asking from these producers. So it's not accessible. And um, what you end up with is regular farmers, regular people who are spending most of their time out there in the field, they don't have the time and money and energy to compete with that. It's only the big industrial operations where they're doing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in money every year. They can afford to hire the high priced grant writer who knows that program to go out and apply for that government money. So we really, you know, fixing how we access these funds and prioritizing getting the right money out to the farmers in a way that works for farmers, not in a way that works for bureaucrats, I think is number one. Thank you, Ryan. All right, with that, I do think we're gonna wrap up. There is so many things we have not had the time to address and we could talk for hours, but we've covered a lot. Um, and there's more questions that we did not address, but you know, get in contact with us and we'll, we'll We'll give our perspective or connect you with uh, the people that can help answer your questions. Um, but I want to thank all of our panelists so much for your time, your commitment, all the fantastic work that you were just doing every day, contributing to the movement. And let's keep on fighting and keep on, keep on working towards a better future. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.